The tiny community of Harpers Ferry is nestled here between the Potomac and the Shenandoah Rivers, and its historic district is one of the best preserved sites in America. The district covers a small area only a few blocks long. All the historic sites are easily within walking distance of each other, and most are open to the public. At many of the restored buildings, you'll find costumed interpreters. There's a blacksmith shop, stagecoach inn, tavern, and old-fashioned marshal's office. You would have been required to come into this office once a month to be administered the oath of allegiance to the government of the United States. Harper House, built in 1782, is the oldest surviving structure in town. It's now a small museum filled with 19th century furnishings. Right here on the land where I'm walking, there once stood a giant weapons arsenal. As you can see, all that remains now is a bit of the foundation. It was deliberately destroyed by Union forces looking to keep it out of Confederate hands. But the arsenal is more famous for another incident, a confrontation that occurred here in 1859 two years before the Civil War began that fanned the flames of the slavery issue. It was started by a radical abolitionist named John Brown, and it was ended by Robert E. Lee, at that time a U.S. Army commander. You can view scenes from this dramatic event at the John Brown Wax Museum on High Street. It depicts his lifelong fight against slavery, which came to a violent end here at Harper's Ferry. John Brown was a radical abolitionist who wanted to strike a decisive blow against slavery, but to do it, he needed weapons, like the ones stored here at the Harpers Ferry Arsenal. Dennis Fry is the former chief historian at Harpers Ferry and an expert on 19th century America. He picks up the John Brown story at Arsenal Square. Dennis, what was John Brown's actual plan? The plan was to capture the arsenal in the army with its 100,000 weapons, move the weapons out of Harpers Ferry into the mountains throughout the south, and then stage a guerrilla warfare throughout the south, bringing slaves into these garrisons, these strongholds, these forts that would be held and protected by the weapons that had been seized at Harpers Ferry. So but what actually happened? Well, it didn't work as, it, as they had expected. In fact, Brown made the fire engine house of the U.S. Army his headquarters. And as the raid progressed, more and more of his men were either shot down or captured. And finally, they were hemmed in this very small building when the United States Marines arrived. Here? Yes, in here. Mm -hmm. The doors were closed, uh, they were barricaded, and the Marines used a ladder and a sledgehammer to try to break through the doors. Eventually, they succeeded in putting a small hole large enough for one man at a time to crawl through. The first man that crawled into this building was Lieutenant Israel Green. And when he came in here, the room was filled with smoke from the gunpowder and also still dark. It was just about dawn. And someone pointed out Brown, John Brown, to Green. And Green lunged at him with his sword. And instead of penetrating as it should, because it was a direct, direct stab right at the center torso of John Brown, but instead of penetrating, the sword actually struck a belt buckle or some kind of plate that Brown had on his chest and bounced off. So Green then took the hilt of the sword and used it as a club and began to strike Brown over the head until he knocked him unconscious. Brown survived the assault and the hostages he held were rescued unharmed. Lee's troops escorted the badly wounded Brown to nearby Charlestown for trial. He was found guilty of treason, murder, and slave insurrection and executed six weeks after his capture at Harper's Ferry. It's interesting to walk the streets of Harper's Ferry knowing that the town changed hands at least eight times during the Civil War. It's easily worth a full day's visit. Harper's Ferry is adored by the visitor for two reasons. One, its beauty is majestic. Its natural beauty is so splendorous that people come here just to enjoy the beauty and harmony of nature. But the other thing that makes it so interesting is that humankind has said such substantial history here, history which has changed not only the history of our nation, but our entire world, our whole humanity. And they come here to learn and study about those changes which occurred at this spot. If you're spending the night, you'll find several historic inns and bed and breakfast establishments to choose from here. This one's called The View, and when you step out on their back porch, you can see why. Hilltop House was built in 1888 and also enjoys a spectacular view. It played host to Mark Twain, Alexander Graham Bell, and President Woodrow Wilson. 
The general price range for inns in the area is $50 to $120 a night. Something else you might want to try if you're spending a weekend night during the summer is to go along on a Harpers Ferry ghost tour. It's only $2 per person for the one-hour walk. Your guide lights the path with her gas lantern and tells some hair-raising stories along the way. We had a strange thing happen here. We had a gentleman show up in town. But this man was in his late 50s. He was dressed much as they would have been in the 1800s. And he looked exactly like the pictures that we have of John Brown. But the tourists coming to town all thought this man was a park employee and that he was here to interpret the fort to them. But they would always ask him to pose with their families for pictures and he always obliged. But when those pictures were developed, where the members of the family stood were perfectly clear, but where that man stood was totally blank. And the Department of Interior in Washington, D.C. has seven or eight of those negatives that were sent to them to prove that maybe John Brown did visit our town one more time. We're hoping for an exclusive interview with Mr. Brown. The John Brown confrontation thrust Lee into the national spotlight. A few years later, during the Civil War, another important chapter in Lee's life would take place just north of here, along a small creek called Antietam. Our journey through Robert E. Lee country continues as we travel north from Harper's Ferry to the area around Antietam Creek. On your way to Antietam, a charming place to stop is here at Shepherdstown, West Virginia. Most of the buildings were used as hospitals for Lee's troops after the Battle of Antietam, which was fought just across the river. Today, the buildings house some great little shops, like this old soda fountain. The original bank is now a colorful restaurant. The George Tyler Moore building houses the Civil War Research Center. And if the name Tyler Moore sounds familiar, it should. Mary Tyler Moore purchased this building, which once belonged to her great-great-great-grandfather, and donated it back to the town. The center is open to anyone looking to do serious research on the Civil War. Whether you're here for full-time study or full-time fun, you should take a walk down by the Potomac River here in Shepherdstown. You'll find some interesting ruins here, like those old bridge pilings. In the early months of the war, the Confederates burned that bridge to prevent the Federals from crossing into Southern territory. Since the Potomac was a north-south dividing line, Shepherdstown, West Virginia was a border town. In fact, the state of West Virginia was actually created as a direct result of the Civil War. The people here didn't agree with Virginia's decision to secede, so this territory remained part of the Union. Shepherdstown is the oldest community in West Virginia, established in the 1730s. It was originally selected as a possible site for the nation's capital, but was rejected in favor of Washington. Despite its position on the north-south border, the town suffered only one engagement during the war, and it happened right here at the Fort of the Potomac when Confederate troops recaptured artillery equipment from Union forces. The skirmish occurred during Lee's retreat from the bloodiest battle of them all. Antietam fought just five miles from here at Sharpsburg. Fire. <laughs> The Antietam National Battlefield, 960 acres set aside to honor the 23,000 men killed or wounded during the bloodiest single day in U.S. military history. During the summer months, you might catch an artillery demonstration put on by the Living History Volunteers. Or perhaps a period musical performance by members of the Wildcat Regiment Band. These reenactment groups bring history to life with authentic costumes, weaponry, and instruments. If you check the event schedule with the National Park Service before you plan your trip, you can arrange to be here during one of these exhibitions. The battlefield is open from dawn to dusk. All the famous sites, such as the Cornfield, Bloody Lane, and Burnside Bridge are accessible by car. But the thing to do is walk this site, especially early in the morning mist. It will bring out a sense of peace and spirituality that's hard to describe. One of the most important factors in the Battle of Antietam is that Lee, for the first time, attempted to invade Northern Territory. And if it wasn't for a single piece of paper, 
found lying in a field near Frederick, 40 miles from here, he might have succeeded. A Union soldier sitting under a tree noticed a strange object lying on the ground. It was a piece of paper wrapped around three cigars. But when he unwrapped it, he realized he held Lee's master invasion plan in his hands. He delivered it to Union headquarters, and for the next few days, the North knew every move the South was going to make. That piece of paper has become known to history as the Lost Orders. With Lee's game plan conveniently in hand, Union General George McClellan was just a day's hard march from Lee's army, which was struggling toward the town of Sharpsburg. It was here that Lee decided to make his stand. When McClellan arrived, the two armies established battle lines west and east of Antietam Creek. Once again, Dennis Fry takes us back to visualize what it was like that September 17th in 1862. Mr. Miller's cornfield, 30 acres of ground, saw five Union assault moving forward across this ground to try to break the Confederate left commanded by Jackson. They would not succeed as Confederate counter assaults would plow into the Union waves and stop them time after time. And after two hours of fighting, nearly 8,000 men had fallen on this ground. As the action ended up in the cornfield, it moved here to the Confederate center. And this would become known as Bloody Lane because during three hours of fighting, wave after wave after wave of Union forces would attack this position and would be stopped. So you had line after line of Confederates here facing the Union forces as they were approaching. And they were able to get their shots off in a vertical position and be relatively safe as a result of the embankment here protecting them. The battle at Bloody Lane raged for nearly four hours until Union troops finally gained the upper hand, but the day's fighting was far from over. Late in the day, one of the most violent struggles took place here at Burnside Bridge, named after Union General Ambrose Burnside, whose men repeatedly tried to force their way across the bridge. An interesting and unusual way to see this area of the battlefield is by a canoe tour along Antietam Creek. Dennis and other local experts lead these tours, which offer visitors a peaceful journey through the countryside at this historic site. This was the final phase of the Battle of Antietam, the federal effort to try to take this position. The federal forces were on the east bank of the creek and the Confederate on the west bank, on the high ground on the west bank, nearly 100 feet higher than the Federals were. 400 Georgians held this position for almost three hours before the final wave, the final attack by the Federals, finally succeeded in taking this bridge. Is this the actual bridge? This is the actual bridge. It was constructed in 1836. It witnessed the battle, and so did the large sycamore tree on the east bank of the bridge. Uh, it was about 20 feet high at the time. Canoe and kayak tours can be set up through companies like River and Trail Outfitters. The paddling tours last about seven hours and will run you about $60 per person, which includes a picnic lunch. Burnside Bridge is the battlefield's best known landmark, but all around Sharpsburg, you can find structures that survived the war. Although this one still shows a scar from a Union cannonball. This small farmhouse is another example. Union soldiers invaded the place and helped themselves to whatever they wanted. The owners asked for and received $2,500 in restitution after the war. Today, it's known as the Piper House, a quaint bed and breakfast. Rooms here are about $85 a night. Another interesting place to stay is the Bavarian Inn just across the Potomac. It offers some great views of the river and the ruins of the old railroad bridge. Prices range from about $85 to $250 a night. As amazing as it may seem, more American soldiers lost their lives on this battlefield near Antietam Creek than on the beaches of Normandy at D-Day. Lee wasn't defeated here, but he couldn't claim victory either. He'd failed to win on northern territory. The following year, Lee would once again invade the north. And this time, the North would meet South in Pennsylvania at a small town called Gettysburg. Our journey through Robert E. Lee country continues as we move further north from Antietam to Gettysburg. Oh, Railroads played an integral role in the Civil War. They were used by both sides to transport troops and supplies. 
Right now, I'm taking a ride on the Gettysburg Railroad, which takes visitors back in time to the site of the Civil War's greatest battle and Robert E. Lee's worst defeat. The railroad offers several trips for visitors. This 90-minute ride begins at the train station near the center of Gettysburg and runs alongside the battlefield in the National Historic Park just west of town. On many of the trips, you can enjoy period military music while you pass by some of the key battle locations. In order to really appreciate everything you're seeing here at Gettysburg, it's a good idea to do some homework first. If you're not familiar with the three days of the battle, you can pick up some literature at the Visitor's Center, or better still, read a good book or a magazine article on the battle, and then you'll know exactly what you're looking at here. And there is a lot to look at here, over 10 square miles of battlefield sites. We'll be visiting the scene of the first day's battle around Oak Ridge, the second day's battle at Little Round Top, and the third day's battle at Cemetery Ridge. Then we'll take in some of the other sites in the area. The Gettysburg Battlefield has about 30 miles of roadways. It's two miles wide, five miles long. So exploring this area may seem a bit intimidating at first. A good idea is to start your visit at the park's visitor center where you can get a tour map and some ideas about the different ways to get around. I use the center's electric map presentation and cyclorama center to get a good overview of the battle. I then met up with Dr. Walter Powell, the historic preservation officer for Gettysburg. He'll help us better understand what happened on those three days in 1863, beginning here at Oak Ridge, the site of the first day of fighting. Dr. Powell, we've heard about the Battle of Gettysburg all of our lives. Just how big was it, though? This battle involved over 160,000 men on both sides. Uh, in scale, these units were fighting over a 25 square mile area over three days, July 1st, 2nd, and 3rd, 1863. Makes it the largest battle of the American Civil War and the largest battle fought here in the Western Hemisphere. What was General Lee trying to accomplish? Well, he had several objectives. The most important was that he was hoping a major victory on Northern soil would perhaps force the Northern Congress to conclude a treaty with the South and perhaps in a better case scenario, he could move south, capture the capital, and dictate terms in Washington, D.C. From up here on Oak Hill Tower, we get a tremendous view of the fields. Tell us about the first day of fighting here. Battle started with Confederate infantry attacking Union cavalry, and as the day wore on, additional Union infantry and Confederate infantry arrived so that the entire battlefront covered about two miles, including the fields right out in front of us. By late afternoon, the Confederate numbers took their toll, and pushed the Union forces out of these fields, back through the town of Gettysburg to Cemetery Hill, and it looked by late evening as if General Lee had a great victory on his hands. But that night, Union General George Meade arrived with the bulk of the Army of the Potomac. At mid-morning the next day, federal troops took positions on top of a high rocky embankment just south of town called Little Round Top. By the second day, battle lines were drawn across two opposite ridges. The Confederates took up positions on Seminary Ridge along the west side of the field. Union forces were lined up along Cemetery Ridge in a pattern that resembled a fishhook anchored on the south end by the troops holding Little Round Top. Walter, I can see how this position here on the top of Little Round Top would have given the Union soldiers an edge. When the second day's fighting had ended, the Union Army was anchored here on Little Round Top. This was the eye of the fishhook, as it was called. And the critical fighting of that second day was between here and the Devil's Den off to my left. The Confederates had made a concerted effort to take those rocks and to try to seize this hill. Standing on top of the 44th New York Volunteer Monument on Little Round Top, it's easy to picture the savage fighting that day in 1863. Union troops with a commanding view of the field, but Confederate sharpshooters well positioned in the boulders beneath them. The third and final day of the battle dawned red hot. Lee was determined to attack again with full fury. His artillery bombarded federal lines on Cemetery Ridge and Cemetery Hill for more than two hours. Some say the mass of thunderous guns could be heard in Harrisburg more than 40 miles away, but the Union line held. This is General Lee's last desperate gamble. The final day of the fighting, he mustered 12,000 men led by General George Pickett try to break through the Union Center at this point and roll up the Union line. 
And so those men came forward from Seminary Ridge to my right uh, in a valiant effort, came as far as the walls to the right, got over the stone walls where we're standing, and for 10 minutes or so at this point fought hand to hand, only to be driven back with losses exceeding two thirds of the men that came across. An effort that led to the end of the fighting, what we've come to know symbolically as the high water mark of the rebellion. This has to be the most dramatic place for people to see the battlefield. They see the monumentation, the view of the field to our left, and the understanding that at this point, all of that valor, heroism, devotion came to a tragic climax. America at its finest and also the most dramatic moment in the battle. Standing on Cemetery Ridge and looking across this field, it's hard to comprehend the bravery of those troops marching straight into the solid gunfire of Union troops who were positioned right where we're standing now. More than 51,000 Confederates and Union troops were killed, wounded, or captured, and the town was a shambles. Lee took his soldiers back to Virginia exhausted and beaten. War was fought much differently then. When men marched defiantly across open fields directly into the line of fire, casualties were always high. Many of the Union soldiers killed at Gettysburg were laid to rest here at Cemetery Ridge. The Gettysburg National Cemetery was opened in November of 1863, a few months after the battle, while the war continued. At the cemetery's dedication, President Abraham Lincoln was asked to make a few appropriate remarks. Lincoln finished writing his short speech hours before the address, here at the Wills House, located in the historic district of Gettysburg. His Gettysburg address transformed the battlefield into a place of inspiration and deep meaning. The scene is recreated twice each year, on Memorial Day and on November 19th, the anniversary of the address. Four score and seven years ago, our fathers brought forth on this continent a new nation, conceived in liberty, and dedicated to the proposition that all men are created equal. Now we are engaged in a great civil war, testing whether that nation or any nation so conceived and so dedicated can long endure. That we here highly resolve that these dead shall not have died in vain. That this nation, under God, shall have a new birth of freedom. And that government of the people, by the people, for the people, shall not perish from the earth. The war dragged on for two more years, with Lee still leading the Confederate Army. But his loss here at Gettysburg was one of the key turning points of the conflict. We continue our journey through Robert E. Lee country at Gettysburg, Pennsylvania. A fun and an educational way to see the battlefield is on this horseback tour called A Ride into History. As you ride, you hear a live narration about your surroundings over your headset, and it really helps make the setting come alive. These horseback tours can be arranged through national riding stables just south of town. The tour lasts two hours and will run you about $40 a person. It's an easy ride on horseback, but you can expect to be a bit sore if you're not a regular rider. You can also tour the battlefield on a bicycle, and park rangers take visitors on walking tours that provide overviews of different parts of the battle. Private driving tours with licensed battlefield guides can be arranged through the visitor center. The guide actually rides with you in your own car and sometimes drives, so you need to make room. The two-hour tours cost about $25. Over 1.6 million people visit Gettysburg every year, so it can get very crowded, especially in the summer months. The least crowded months are January and February, but the weather can be unpredictable. November is probably the best time to visit. There are more than 1,300 monuments and statues in the park, making it one of the largest sculpture gardens in the world. The Virginia State Monument includes a statue of Lee, unusual for a monument on northern soil. Generals Lee and Meade aren't the only famous Army commanders associated with Gettysburg. About 85 years later, Dwight D. Eisenhower would leave his mark here. Ike so loved this part of the country and the history that took place on these grounds that he bought a small dairy farm here in 1950. Today, his farm is a national historic site and well worth a visit. 
The furnishings of the home range from this very formal living room to the bright casual sun porch to one of Ike's favorite places, the barbecue pit, where he entertained guests like Winston Churchill, Charles de Gaulle, and Nikita Khrushchev. Well, I don't know about Ike and Mamie's barbecue, but personally, I'd prefer the food they serve up in the many historic taverns around the Gettysburg area. They're often attached to small bed and breakfast, like the Her Tavern and Public House on Chambersburg Road. It served as a hospital during the Civil War, or the Doubleday Inn, located right on the edge of the battlefield. Prices at most area inns and B&Bs range from $35 to $150 per night. If you prefer larger accommodations but still want a touch of history, try the Gettysburg Hotel. Built in 1797, the Gettysburg is one of the oldest hotels in America. Prices range from about $75 to $150 a night. It's located in the heart of the city's historic district on Lincoln Square. There's no doubt that the battlefield and the historical park are the big draws here, but there's really lots more. The town of Gettysburg is filled with museums and antique shops and historical shows, so I started my personal exploring right here in the Lincoln Square area. And the Gettysburg Visitors Bureau, which is right down there on Carlisle Street, is a very good place to go to find out where everything is located. If you're interested in Civil War weaponry, a good museum to visit is the Samuel Colt Museum. It's a tribute to the famous weapons maker. In fact, the owner's great-great-grandfather was Colt's first engraver. Here you can see the Springfield musket, the principal firearm used in the Civil War, and this 44 caliber sidearm from 1860. Other good museums for Civil War buffs include General Lee's headquarters, which still houses the original table used by Lee after the first day's fighting. There's also the National Civil War Wax Museum, which often has a living history exhibit out front featuring a period encampment. I was really impressed with the Gettysburg History Center military diorama at the Artillery Ridge Campground on Taney Town Road. It's an accurate, dramatic overview of the Battle of Gettysburg created with over 20,000 hand-painted miniature figures. It's one of the largest military dioramas in the country. Uh, my train arrived in Gettysburg late on Wednesday afternoon, the 18th of November. In the town's historic district, you'll find the Conflict Theater. In addition to a multimedia presentation on the battle, the theater also features James Getty's one-man stage show, Mr. Lincoln Returns to Gettysburg. It's an interpretation of Lincoln done in full costume and makeup. The shows run about an hour and cost five to six dollars. Outside on the street beneath my window. In order to fully experience everything there is to do here in Gettysburg, you should plan on staying two and a half to three days. Use your first good weather day to take in the battlefield sites, and you can see all the museums and shopping, rain or shine. We're going to wrap up our journey through Robert E. Lee country by heading south from Gettysburg toward Appomattox. In early April, 1865, the Confederacy was nearly finished. Lee's starving, ragged army had struggled across southern Virginia until they could go no more. And it all came to an end right here, in the parlor of this house in the tiny hamlet of Appomattox Courthouse. The night Lee's retreating army arrived here, he got a message from Ulysses S. Grant requesting surrender. Lee refused. But the next day, after a final attempt to break the Union lines failed, a flag of truce was carried between the two generals. On April 9th, 1865, the two powerful men met in this parlor at the McLean House. Lee was in full dress uniform, complete with sword and pistol. Grant was dressed in a worn campaign uniform. The two talked over old times for a while. They had served together in Mexico. Then Lee solemnly signed the papers surrendering the Confederate Army of Northern Virginia to the Union armies of the Potomac and the James. Today, the McLean House parlor is still set exactly as it was on that historic day in 1865. The house is part of a vibrant historic district featuring over 25 restored structures. Many visitors enjoy the Living History program where costumed interpreters portraying soldiers from both sides of the war answer questions while staying in character. You'll see lots of restored Civil War period buildings 
like the old courthouse, Meeks General Store, and the Clover Hill Tavern. There are also more than 40 historic homes in the area. There's a very interesting story about the man who owned this house where the surrender took place, a fellow named Wilmer McLean. It seems his first home was in Bull Run in Northern Virginia. And up there during one of the first battles of the Civil War, an artillery shell literally came down his chimney. So looking to move to a little more tranquil spot, he came here to Appomattox Courthouse. Not only did he not get away from the war, the war literally ended right here in his parlor. Lee's distinguished military career also ended here, and so this is a good place to end our journey through Robert E. Lee country. After the war, Lee took a job as president of a small Lexington, Virginia college, later named Washington and Lee University. Although he never fought another battle, Lee's military strategies are still studied by armed forces personnel today. Our trip through Lee Country should take you about seven to ten days, or you don't have to see it all in one trip. Any one of these sites is worth a visit on its own, in a day trip or over a weekend. If you have more time to spend, there are plenty of other historic sites to visit in the area. About an hour southeast of Richmond is the Colonial Parkway, which connects Williamsburg, Jamestown, and Yorktown. All wonderful historic sites well worth visiting. And about an hour north of Richmond is the Fredericksburg and Chancellorsville area, featuring three military parks and numerous colonial sites. Washington, D.C. and Baltimore are only about an hour and a half east of Harpers Ferry and Antietam. And if you head west, be sure to drive the beautiful Blue Ridge Parkway. You can stop at Lexington to view the final resting place of Robert E. Lee at Washington and Lee University, the school at which he was president until he died in 1870. You can also leave a good luck coin at the grave of Lee's famous horse, Traveler. This is a wonderful trip to take with the family. If you have students studying American history like I do, a trip like this helps put everything in perspective. There's nothing like actually walking through the historic sites to better understand what happened and how it still affects our lives today. I'm Bill Boggs. Thank you for joining me on Historic Traveler.